I feel I feel helpless. I've I've like spent 30 years of my life trying to to put victims in a better situation in terms of domestic and colonial violence. And in like in 150 something days, Israel have killed more than 9,000 women, 15,000 children. So what the hell have I been doing for years? Why I did all what I did? It, it doesn't matter now. And I need to keep working. I need to keep trying. I need to be thinking of everyone but myself. And I don't cope and I refuse to cope. My university offered uh, to me many like um, well-being sessions and, um, and do this stuff. And I refuse to take them. I don't accept it. I am in a safe environment and I have the privilege to ask for well-being um, support and all of that. But my people, my beloved people are being killed, are being starved to death, are having their daughters, their kids, their parents, their their houses killed and demolished and all of that. And they are, they, they are looking for just a second of safety, a second of not having the drone over their heads every single second in their life. And I, myself, were privileged with safety. I would seek well-being support? No, because my people don't have that. And secondly, because we're in a situation that nothing will treat it, nothing at all. It's a very high level now. The only thing we can do is to stop it. And this is the only thing that would help me to cope. And after that, I need to go to Gaza. I need to go there and help. This is the only thing that would help me to cope. Nothing more than that. Hello and welcome to Palestine Deep Dive with me, Rada Karmi. Um, I am a Palestinian born in Jerusalem, uh, forced out with my family in the Nakba of 1948. Um, I've grown up in, in England where I have received my education and I became a doctor of medicine, uh, but of course a lifelong activist for Palestine. And I'm also a writer and an academic. On the occasion of International Women's Day, which I'm going to propose should be called Gaza Women's Day this year, given the sufferings uh, of, of Gaza's women, um, uh, uh, which is quite exceptional. Um, I'm going to be looking forward to a conversation with um, a woman from Gaza, Hala Hanina, uh, who is active uh, in work on women's rights and women's activism. Um, uh, welcome to you, Hala. Perhaps you could say a little bit more about yourself, your work. Um, thank you so much, Doctor. Um, I'm Hala Hanina. I'm doing my PhD now in, U in the UK. I'm at the third year. I've just finished my field work in Gaza. Uh, my field work is part of my political and social activism. It's, it was actually about domestic violence. And I was studying the ability of the Palestinian community to combat colonial and domestic violence together uh, as a community. Uh, not, not only as organizations. And in my field work in the 14 month, uh, we were able to come as Palestinians uh, from Gaza Strip, women, men, uh, organizations, decision makers, governmental and non-governmental organizations, parents with their children, we were able to come together um, and create a space where we created three focus or action groups that was focusing on changing the legal and also the traditional aware and the, the awareness level of people to combat domestic violence. However, I left um, a few days before this genocide started while we were hoping to uh, start our first pilot project in combating domestic violence and changing the law. And uh, 25 leaders from the community, women and men, were holding the flag for the change when I left. However, um, just a few days after I left, I found my leaders killed. The places where we did our um, activism, our, our meetings was demolished by the Israeli occupation. Uh, decision makers are also killed. My victims, my survivors who were part of this activism, very mm. unique type of survivors, mostly women, they are also yeah. have been killed yeah. in this genocide. 
Yes, we're going to come to that. Uh, we're going to come to that. Uh, tell me, um, t tell me first of all about your friends, your colleagues. Uh, um, what has happened to them? Many of my many of my friends, like dear friends, um, who I met in Gaza, who I knew them since long time, since years, were volunteers in, in different stuff. And we spent a very beautiful time on the beaches of Gaza, in, in resorts, in cafes, and different places. For instance, my friend, my Reyes, has, um, he's, he's, uh, he, he had taken the scholarship of achieving scholarship at the same time with me in 2019. And uh, he was uh, focusing on women and children health. He did his master's in King's College London. And he was very keen to support women uh, of Palestine and women in Gaza. That's why just after he finished his master's, he went back directly to Gaza to serve the women in Palestine. However, in this um, uh, genocide, he stayed in Gaza city because he wasn't able to, to leave it. And he stayed with his uh, wife, uh, his love uh, of his life, who he had got married to just uh, in May. So. Uh, three weeks, uh, three months before um, before November the fifth. On November the fifth, um, after a very long blackout by the Israeli occupation, we had the news that our dear friend Maisera, uh, along with his uh, seven family members, parents, sisters, um, uh, and also um, nephews and nieces, they were all bombarded in their sixth floor residential building. And since the 5th of November until today, they are they have been underneath the rubble. Although my Sarah's like main wish before he was killed is that he wouldn't uh, stay stuck underneath the, the rubble because he knows uh, as a doctor what happened to the other victims who stayed under the rubble, how, how much they suffered, how they had uh, the wounds coming out, uh, out of, uh, from their injuries and all of that. And unfortunately, my dear friend, Laura, uh, was a very beautiful young woman, active in women's rights. She works at the um, UN Women, uh, and she should now be living the best of her time, serving other women and taking them to the, to the best for their futures. She's now a widow, not able to leave Gaza because she doesn't want to be away from her beloved husband. And she doesn't want to leave uh, Gaza or to live anything without her ability to dignify put her husband um, in the barrier, unfortunately. Many of my friends have, have faced the same uh, the same destiny among them. A friend of mine whose name is uh, Nisreen Jarada, she's uh, a feminist, or she was. She's a, a, a psychotherapist, so she used to, um, to deal with women who have uh, been dealing with domestic violence, survivors of, vict uh, of domestic violence or victims of that. And she was among the active pillars in my, in my research and my activism in Gaza to combat domestic violence. Unfortunately, at the beginning of this genocide, um, her and all of her family, um, they had their home uh, bombarded by the Israeli occupation forces. And for a few hours, we had no news about her and her family. And then um, at like afternoon, late afternoon, we had the news that her family were, were uh, removed from underneath the rubble, all killed. And uh, it was almost like um, getting um, getting like uh, dark and when it's darker and when it's night Israel bombard people more and more so no one was able to go and retreat the rest of the bodies among them Nisreen herself um, however her fiance um, again the love of her life he went he put his own life in danger and he kept stayed there until he was able to retreat her her parts of her body and he removed her took her to a place where he was able to bury her and spend the night crying there. So um, just remembering like two of at least 300 of women and men, very dear friends of mine who have been killed in the last um, starting, we're, we're getting into the, the six months now. So, just remembering that, remembering, remembering that I've lost them. They have been killed in the most brutal way. It's it's not even, it wouldn't be even like punished. No one would punish the Israeli occupation for committing those crimes. And this genocide, it has never been been like punished. Israel have never been punished. They were granted a state for their crimes. And now they will be granted expansion of the Israeli colony. 
So I know that um, living all that sadness, having my friends killed, the places demolished, our memories um, killed, I don't know what would be our, our situation now. Uh, look, I don't know what to say. This is a terrible, terrible story. Um, but I'm sadly, like so many other stories, um, I just want to ask you really, how do you cope? Uh, I know you're not there physically, but of course, hearing these things happening to your people very close to you uh, must have had uh, an effect uh, on you, <clears throat> on your work, on your life. Say a little bit about that. Um, it's clear for me and for anyone from Palestine, specifically from Gaza, that we don't cope. We don't cope, we don't grieve, we don't have even the time to relax a little bit and think of those people who have who we have lost. When I talk with my friends, so many times, like I, I would mention a friend of us and I, I wouldn't remember to say Allah Yerhamu because I forgot that he or she are killed. So we don't have the time to process or grieve or remember what happened because the genocide is still going. It doesn't stop. In the moment, I was sad for my friend Ahmed al Nauk who had his 22 members of his family killed in, 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 in one minute. I was like crying, sitting by his side. And at the same moment, we received another news that my dear friend, uh, Shuru al had her husband killed in front of her eyes in Gaza. So we don't even have the time to process, to think, or, or, or just coping. And we know that we don't have the time for that because the genocide is still ongoing. And because if we just like thought of having that, that the type of legacy or that type of um, relaxation to think of that, many other people will be killed at the same time. And when they are killed, we wouldn't even have the time to think about those who are killed now. And it's very sad and very bad because we have a responsibility. Like I myself, I find myself at a very responsible situation because everyone in Gaza, all my friends and all my family are telling me all the time, Hala, you are outside Gaza for a reason. And I am killing myself to know what is the reason of me being outside. How would I be able to help more? How would I be able to stop this insanity and this genocide? What's happening to everyone? And it's very sad because I feel I feel helpless. I've I've like spent thirty years of my life trying to to put victims in a better situation in terms of domestic and colonial violence. And in like in 150 something days, Israel have killed more than 9,000 women, 15,000 children. So what the hell have I been doing for years? Why I did all what I did? It, it doesn't matter now. And I need to keep working. I need to keep trying. I need to be thinking of everyone but myself. And I don't cope and I refuse to cope. My university offered uh, to me many like um, well-being sessions and um, and those stuff, and I refuse to take them. I don't accept it. I am in a safe environment, and I have the privilege to ask for well-being um, support and all of that. But my people, my beloved people, are being killed, are being starved to death, are having their daughters, their kids, their parents, their their houses killed and demolished and all of that. And they are, they, they are looking for just a second of safety, a second of not having the drone over their heads every single second in their life. And I, myself, who are privileged with safety, I would seek well-being support? No, because my people don't have that. And secondly, because we're in a situation that nothing will treat it. Nothing at all. It's a very high level now. The only thing we can do is to stop it. And this is the only thing that would help me to cope. And after that, I need to go to Gaza. I need to go there and help. This is the only thing that would help me to cope. Nothing more than that. Okay. And I think you probably speak for many other people in your, in your situation. And you've told you, you, the way you've spoken is so eloquent. It, it, really drives home a message. I mean, it should occur to you that one of the important duties, obligations you have is to tell the story, you know. Uh, so please don't underestimate the importance of that. If you are in Gaza and God knows what might have happened to you or might happen to you, it 
it's not possible to give out this message that you have done so eloquent. Don't, don't underestimate that. I, I want to perhaps uh, move to a more general question about the position of Palestinian women under occupation in general and in Gaza in particular. Now, leaving aside clearly this last uh, nearly six months uh, of abnormal madness uh, and, and, and brutality and murder. And women, Gaza women in general, what would you say about their lives, their situation? I think Palestinian women are among the, the most resilient and strongest women I've ever, I've ever met. Although they have been faced with colonial violence, occupational violence all over all of our lives, it's not just since the 7th of October, even in May 2023, there was Israeli aggression over us in Gaza. So I believe that women who have been struggling all over their lives have, have been doing that in a very systematic manner to combat um, occupational violence, colonial violence, and domestic violence. Every place in the world have domestic violence. Patriarchal violence exists and domestic violence does exist. But our women have never stood silent in face of that. And in our community, our women and men were able to stand together to combat that in a very systematic way, creating uh, action groups to combat the domestic violence um, in, in legal terms and also awareness terms and, and, and you know, providing spaces for protection for women. And our women have, have always been like so creative. I don't know if you know or not, but in Gaza, we have a very high unemployment rate, although we have the highest literate, uh, literate uh, rate in the world. So our women and men are the highest uh, around the world in, um, in education and all of that. And they are very skilled, like every man and woman we have are very skillful. They have so many, so many, um, so many skills. Uh, for instance, my sisters, uh, they are pharmacists. However, they were not able to find like a pharmacy proper job because of the high unemployment rate. So mm -hmm. they learned something online, and now both of them are um, uh, are uh, like voiceovers or uh, doing uh, voice uh, voice arts online, and they work in that. They used to before the genocide. So many women have been doing the same. Like they would be doctors, they would be nurses, or secret or teachers or anything, and they would be learning something in you and earning money from that and helping the family to grow further and progress. And the same mm. our men have been doing. They have been learning other stuff, teaching that to the women and men around them. And they were building hubs and teams to combat internationally and bring uh, proper salaries to their families. Uh, so although the odds, al although the very hard and harsh situations we have been living it through them, we as Palestinian community, women and men, were standing together to combat that and bring something more fruitful and beautiful for us. And each yeah. time we were able to build that thing, Israel came and demolished it, damaged it and killed us who were trying to do that. If I yeah. myself was in Gaza, because I was like leading some progress and change, Israel would have killed me 100%. They have killed anyone in the academia, in the health sector, in the journalism, and in human rights who have been making progress and effect to the community. So they would have killed me. And that's why they have killed the people in the community and the people in my teams who have been making a progress and making a change. So women in, in Gaza and women in Palestine, although all like the colonial and occupation and all of that violence, they also have like any woman in the world, domestic violence. And we used to have like proper channels where those victims would be able to find like consultation, uh, psychological support, physical support, legal support, and also to put like, uh, sometimes to put the perpetrators in prisons and all of that, or to stay at a protection sh shelter that we have two of them in Gaza, very strong and very good protection centers that were growing and progressing and expanding to provide better services to young women uh, and young children. Mm -hmm. However, at this genocide, I still receive some victims who are who, who had like uh, some of my victims had imprisoned their um, their perpetrators, but because of the Israeli occupation genocide, everyone in the prisons are city free. 
You can't yeah. keep prisoners inside a prison while there is a genocide because no one will be there to look after them and feed them. So you open the prisons and all the prisoners are outside. And now the victims, the survivors who have been fighting for years to have themselves helped and saved are now with their perpetrators. And they yeah. can't escape because all services are, are damaged. All uh, organizations are already demolished. There is no funding coming. Our leaders of the organizations, many of them are already killed. And those women have no one else to go for unless the perpetrator himself or themselves, because yeah. there is nothing now to go for. So mm -hmm. women who have been like finding ways and struggling and striving for better life, and they have made it, are now either stuck with their perpetrators or already killed as many of mm. my survivors and friends, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Tell me just a, a quick uh, a word about domestic violence. Do you, do you think that um, perhaps some of this domestic violence is also a result of the Israeli occupation? And by that I mean where everybody is frustrated and men are frustrated by the situation of being under occupation and could take it out on weaker people, women, children. How, how much of a role do you think that plays in domestic violence? Um, I believe up to my research and up to my field work research that colonial violence and occupational violence is very much connected because many of the women I, I, I met and interviewed, they told me that their husbands have become violent after either being imprisoned at the Israeli prisons or caught at checkpoints if they were like working in 1948, the occupied areas, or mm -hmm. um, or like within the aggression itself, they, they will become more sometimes protective and at the same time more violent, trying to protect the family and put them together um, um, in, in so many ways. And also, many told me that after the aggressions, they would also become violent because of the violent structure and violent atmosphere they have been inside it. So they would be um, like internalizing that and then expressing it, unfortunately, to the people around them. And so many women and men who have been growing in domestic violence environments, uh, even the adults of them, they told me that their their parents, after they had like uh, like parents, mother and father, unfortunately, and so many times, who have lost their jobs uh, because of the unemployment rate that was raised or because of the Israeli aggressions and the Israeli bombardment of um, like factories or um, the agricultural lands where the parents used to work or those who were um, denied working at the um, uh, 1948 areas, they have mm. become more violent after that because they have lost the income, they have been um, treated in violent way and after that, they have expressed the same violence over their families. However, yeah. those people who I interviewed, after they told me about that, they told me that we had places and we sought help. And that help was actually impactful. And it's changed how our families treated us. And we, we made a, a progress and so many good things happened. But now, those people are stuck in the same position. Those violent people are now internalizing more violence and also having no way of protection or no way of stopping their, their violence or even like um, just to, to put them in, in, in a sense of not to harm anyone because we don't have yeah. anything now. Even our police officers, we used to have like female and male police officers. I used to call them when, whenever there's like someone in violence and need to be protected. But now there is no one to call because Israel is bombarding each police officer and their yeah. families around Gaza Strip. So there is no yeah. no place to go for. So it's not no, just no. they inter like they put the violence into people, and they they make people more violent toward their own families and the people around them. But they also dismantle any protective measures that we have created, and those our victims have sought help by. So we're just kept in a very violent situation because of that. Yeah, this is um, yeah. It's, it's very bad. It's very bad from all points of view. Um, you know, I'm just thinking, um, you and I know how important women are in, in Palestinian society, uh, in Palestinian life. Um, you know, the Palestinian mother is proverbial. Um, the, 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 the 
people who held the families together. Uh, I mean, I come from a previous generation to you. And when the ethnic cleansing of 1948 happened and uh, people were forced out and became refugees, it's truly remarkable that they did not all go mad and become violent criminals themselves, reflecting what had been done to them. And in my opinion, and not only mine, the credit goes to the Palestinian mother, who, despite all those difficulties, held the family together, gave them an identity, gave them something to live for. Uh, it, the, the role of women in Palestinian society is very, very, very large and is unacknowledged to a certain extent. So my question to you is, is can we regard the tragedy of, of Palestinians um, as a, as a, is Palestine a feminist issue in, in a way? What do you think? I believe that Palestine is a feminist issue. And when I say that, I mean that all Palestinians, women, men, children, are the oppressed in the feminist issue. And Israelis, women soldiers, male soldiers, and all the Israelis are the oppressors in this equation. And it's not just that like equation of oppressed and oppressors, but we also need to understand that the Israeli occupation are actually using the tools that the patriarchal community uses to control the oppressed. And that's why feminist, like feminist values are very important. For instance, the Israeli occupation is uh, like since the beginning of genocide over the Palestinians, they have been always blaming the Palestinian. And that is actually victim blaming. Like for anyone who knows anything about women's rights and feminism and all of that would actually be able to understand that the Israelis the perpetrators are blaming the victims who are weaker and who are trying to survive and resist to survive and then say about themselves like the Israelis call what they do by committing a genocide over all the oppressed Palestinians, occupied Palestinians, to call it a self-defense. How would an occupying power, the most powerful army in the world among the most powerful and the, the most people who are trading in armed, be self-resisting against occupied community. How would that even be like logically acceptable? It's not because it doesn't happen. This is literally abusing, victim blaming and blaming the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of this genocide, when the Palestinians were like by media and officials being blamed for, uh, for the genocide that have been committed against them in October and even bev before that, I was just thinking, just imagine as a, as, as a woman activist, if I had a man coming to me because I was accepting any, any, like, any victim to come, women, men, children, anyone, I don't, um, like, I, I don't tolerate any type of violence. So if a man came to me and he told me that, uh, Hala, please come and help me. My sister have scratched my face and I need to do a legal thing against her. And I, I just ran immediately and go to the police station and issued a complaint against um, like his sister. However, in the other situation, I would have gone and searched what happened. I would have discovered that his sister was under his caging and imprisoning for 15 or 17 years. And he have been raping her, hitting her and killing her, her, her kids. And after that, after 15 to 17 years of this torture, she was able to just have her hand outside and scratch his face. And then he mm -hmm. came and told me to help him. And if I was stupid, I would help him, but I'm not. I do search for the context and what actually happened. There's a victim and I need to save her. And if there was any kind of responses from the victim, could be held accountable also but not before accounting the real perpetrator. Yeah. The man who put her in a cage and who was torturing her for years. This yeah. is how I was able to see, to see like contextualize what was happening, contextualize the victim blaming of the Palestinians that the whole world was actually able to, to see and you know to in, inflict um, upon the Palestinians. And just to just to resonate of uh, on what you said about the Palestinian women and Palestinian mothers, for the Palestinian community, like we we upheld our our parents in a very high position. 
religiously and non-religiously, like traditionally. They're very important and very precious to us, specifically mothers. And just to see what happe what's happening to our mothers now at this genocide, it's unbelievable. If you just thought it in, in statistics, 63 women at least are killed each day by the Israeli occupation in Gaza only. 37 of them are mothers. Those same women and those same mothers were the only thing that their kids were thriving by their help. Those women were the people who were like queuing to, to take like bread, queuing for water, queuing for food, and queuing for treatment of their kids. And those are the same women who have been cooking for their kids and providing warmth at the very cold nights by putting their children into their lap to make sure that they wouldn't get uh, any colder or die of cold. And those women are killed. And not just that, those with the same women who, ha who are killed at this genocide are the same women who are, like in Gaza, we have at least 60,000 women who are pregnant with 300% miscarriages. I mm. have never heard of such percentage of miscarriages in the world. And it's not because we're like, we have issue, natural issue. No, it's a designed thing and strategy by the Israeli occupation to combat our uh, ability to reproduce. And it's something in their ideology to be able to, to, to kill a community, eradicate them, and also to take their land to annex it. You need to reduce the number of people. And you do that by killing them and also attacking their reproductive health. And Israel does that. So those women, our women, our beautiful women, who are like holding very unimaginable responsibilities because of the, this genocide, and having their kids orphaned in front of their eyes, having their husbands and parents killed in front of their eyes, but they can't do anything because they need to do what, what, what you said exactly. They need to stay strong, resilient, and keep the community, keep their, their like family together, not to lose their say and not to become criminals. They need to be there for them. And at the same time, those same women are having their periods without sanitary baths, without yeah. painkillers, are having pregnancies without any type of, you know, uh, reviews and um, medical checks and all of that, are having deliveries without going to the hospital because they can't go to the hospital because Israel has demolished all of them and damaged them. They are having C-sections without anesthetics, as if the C-section itself with, with anesthesia is something that people can withstand, and they're having it without anesthetics. And our same woman, are having like after delivery hemorrhage, which is postpartum hemorrhage, and Israel denies the postpartum hemorrhage control material. So they are forced to have their uterus removed. So some of our beautiful women and mothers having their first child in life or rest of children had, had their uterus removed and became infertile because Israel designed a situation where reproductive health of Palestinian women is not important and something to be attacked and is still attacked. This is yeah. so the situation our women, our mothers are facing and living through it at this genocide. While I can't, I can't imagine my friend who had delivery at home because their house like was surrounded with uh, Israeli tra uh, uh, tracks and, and she had to deliver while having no one with any experience of that. But Alhamdulillah, it worked. She, she delivered the baby. But then she stayed for hours, unable to find any sharp object to cut yeah. the, um, uh, the cord the with the baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the empirical cord. She wasn't able to do that. And after mm -hmm. that, she had to walk six hours, a just delivering woman. She had to walk six hours with her husband to a nearby hospital to cut the empirical cord. Wow. How mm -hmm. would this impact mm -hmm. her? And the bad story didn't end here because she didn't, she, because of her, like, she's so tired, she's so dry, she's so starved, she wasn't able to produce milk, she wasn't able to breastfeed her baby. And her baby now is dehydrated and mm. is becoming as a skeleton, and there is no milk to feed the, the baby, and there is yeah. no milk in her to feed the baby, and there is no solution. Her baby might become one of those 17 babies, infants, who have been drying and starved to death by the Israeli occupation in the last week, only in the last week. 
And just to imagine the amount of pain, the amount of suffering our Palestinian women and their responsibilities they are holding at the same time is unimaginable. And having yeah. to talk about anything at this day, like a woman day, rather than Palestinian women and all women who are suffering at this time is a crime. Sure. And it yeah. should be held accountable for anyone who's not looking at the suffering of the Palestinian women, a suffering that was designed by the Israeli occupation and still committed. Definitely, definitely. I mean, what you illustrate there is the fact that uh, that women undergo more than one layer of suffering. So if you're a man, uh, you can be wounded, injured, or shot dead. But as a woman, you can be all you can have all that done to you, but also to you as a mother, as uh, to your child, to your body, as as a as a new mother. Uh, it, it's now. Let me ask you: Have you have Western feminists um, said anything? about um, the women of Gaza? Are you aware of um, specific messages of concern, support, activism from Western feminists? From uh, my knowledge, I haven't heard any strong messages coming from uh, like strong feminists who have been always following, who have been always proud of knowing and um, supporting the same causes that we I thought that we are supporting. Uh, but apparently, uh, the white feminists haven't been occupied and colonized before. So this is something that they can't relate to. And this is something that until now they haven't spoken out against. Hillary Clinton, um, and many other feminists, white and non-white feminists, have been either silent or literally doing almost nothing in a front of like if if we if we just said that um like the crimes I have just said in the last thirty minutes, if I like asked for a response equal to those crimes. If they worked hard for years and spoke very loudly about all of that, it wouldn't be enough. However, those like 30 minutes of the crimes I, I mentioned, they haven't even mentioned it. Women like feminists around the world have been talking about the lies that the Israeli occupation have been saying of the sexual harassment and all of that that was never verified. And they are talking about it while at the same time they haven't talked about the verified reports of the Israeli occupation forces who have been raping, harassing, stripping men and women and sexually and physically assaulting them. And this is verified. This is by UN reports and this is by witnesses and all of that. But they have been like silent as nothing have happened because we're Palestinians. But when unverified reports are coming out, then those feminists and the international media outlets would be covering them without even having one evidence on that. And this is very shameful. This is very disgusting. This is very racist and very unfeminist. They can't call themselves feminist if they have those double standards. They either stop calling themselves feminists or we find something else to call ourselves uh, like as a name or a, or or a, um, or a notion or something because we can't share the same notion with them if we don't share the same values underneath it equally for everyone. I um, my friend I have a friend and she does uh, she does type of activism I used to do when I was in Gaza so either to help in hospitals or to help in shelters. And she went. Um, she went to one of the hospitals to check on patients to see if they if she can help with anything, giving them any charity, um, or just to check with them and give them a company. And she was able to spot uh, a thirteen-year-old girl, um, child. She was alone, and she had her leg amputee. Uh, um, uh, amputee. Um, and she was able to spot like um, um, a blood um, beneath her her legs. And she was like, she went to the nurse and she asked her, um, is she bleeding? Like, does she have an injury here? And she said, no, it's just at the, like the lower part of her limb. So uh, she asked her, but she's having a blood. Uh, are you sure she's okay? 
And the nurse was like, it might be her period. And this girl came with no family. She's the only sole wounded child with no surviving family. And when my friend went and talked with her, she understood that this 13-year-old child is having her first period and she has her leg amputee and she doesn't have any family member around her. And also there is no sanitary pads. So this little girl would be able to use after going through all of those traumatic events. And I, I, I just like remember this one girl and think, did the feminists did anything that would be equal to the pain that this little girl alone had endured? No, at all. They have done like massive things to people who suffered like one of those crimes internationally, but they haven't like even for once covered one of those issues and one of our victims yeah. as as equal as they should have been accounting the world for. And I hope that listening to that and knowing that wouldn't put them again in a defensive position because this is shame. It should put them in activism and in a position where they want to move now and change the situation, understanding what's happening to our women, men and children. And again, for me as a Palestinian, women, men, children are in the feminist um, uh, our feminist issue and are all oppressed by the Israelis, women, men also. And we need all of us to move together and change the situation. Because if feminists wouldn't move, then why would I have any faith in them anymore? Yeah, of course. Of course, I think I understand and everybody watching this understands. Tell me before we, lastly, in, in, in this, um, in our conversation, um, uh, which has been re painful, but really wonderful uh, in with your eloquence and your ability to get across exactly what's what's happening. Um, I wanted to uh, lastly move on to the issue of women's resilience, because, you know, there will come a time when this nightmare is over. Um, but what then? How do you assess the ability of women who we both agreed are absolutely crucial to the future of Palestinian life? Uh, how do you assess their ability to be resilient and to, to, to be around, to, to go on fighting uh, um, and, and surviving? How do you, what would you say about that? Since the beginning of this genocide, and um, as a person who, who lived all of her life, or most of her life in Gaza, and witnessed all the Israeli aggressions over Gaza, I was always able to know that our women, our men, our community is able to come together and support each other and do the solidarity type of um, emotional support and staying together at the hardest times. So we were able after that to grow better and stronger. However, in this genocide, the amount of the Israeli atrocities, the amount of the Israeli crimes, the amount of crimes that have literally damaged each family. It's not like they have like, um, like killed or um, um, killed or murdered like fifth of the community and the rest are okay, can't take care of the rest. No, they have killed like more than 40,000 of us. They have made widows, God only knows how many. 25,000 of our children are orphaned by them at least. And more than 75,000 are injured. And more than 90% of all of our community are now refugees. So this ability of the community to take those people who are having issues and put them in our hearts and take care of them is now paralyzed because Israel have committed crimes, like unimaginable crimes against all of us. So we, although we have always been resilient, we've always been strong and we will stay resilient and strong and we stand with each other and we will stand with each other. However, this is not fair. Our feelings as Palestinians now is exactly as a feeling of a child my friend talked about 
eight-year-old child came to the hospital with two other siblings, five and four. And this child had injuries all over his body, and he asked the doctor to approach, and he whispered. He told the doctor, doctor, don't tell my younger brother and sister that my parents are killed. I saw them. I know they are killed, but don't tell them that. They will go in trauma, and they wouldn't withstand that. Eight-year-old child. Is an eight-year-old child resilient? No, he's not. But he knows that he's in a situation where he has to be stronger and stay stronger for the younger that he has with him, that he become responsible of. And this is the situation of all of us as, as Palestinians. We're not resilient because we love being heroes, no, but because we don't have any option. There is no people standing in our back, and we need that. We need people standing and supporting us in our back so we can rest a little bit and take care of each other in a softer manner, not this very aggressive and painful and ugly way. We need people to come and support us so we can stay resilient. Otherwise, we would stay strong and support each other, but it wouldn't be the same. We need people. We need a lot of them. And we need a lot of support. Thank you very much. Uh, that call should go out to the whole world. And if there was any sense of morality out there, uh, this call will be answered. Um, thank you That's very much. Thank you very much, Hala, for sharing your um, thoughts, your emotions, your uh, experiences with, with us. Uh, on International uh, Women's Day, which should be the very last time when we talk like this. And I really hope it will not come around again. So let us look forward to better times. Um, that's the only way that we humans can survive. Thank you so much, Dr.